Hello and welcome into this Code Rage mobile session. My name is Stephen Ball and we are going to be looking over the next 25-30 minutes at building the Property Cross mobile application using Delphi XE4. For those who haven't met me before, then I'm one of the technical sales consultants here at Embarcadero and um, there'll be more about this project and also what I've been doing building this application up on my blog at blogs.embarcadero.com forward slash Stephen Ball and uh, if you're following me on Twitter then you'll be sure to know when those um, blog posts are made available. My Twitter is Delphi Abul. So let's start talking about what Property Cross is because that's probably the, the first big question most of you have got watching this video. Well, Property Cross represents a non-trivial application and it's designed up for searching UK property listings. It's been developed using a range of cross-platform technologies and frameworks and the aim of the project is to provide developers with a practical insight into the strengths and weaknesses of each framework. Now, the Property Cross project is the, the brainchild of um, Colin Eberhard and Chris Price and um, thanks to the, the Nestoria guys for providing their APIs out to them. So why do we need to have something like Property Cross? Well, we can read on the, the website's view there on the right hand side, it's about helping you select a cross-platform mobile framework. Now obviously FireMonkey is a great framework that um, you should be aware of now if you're um, watching some of these Code Rage sessions for developing applications not only for Windows and Mac but also for iOS and we have uh, Android coming along in the future as well. We thought it was uh, about time to actually create an example so we can compare its performance and its, uh, its usage against the other frameworks out there and give you the chance to be able to do the same. So when we start looking at trying to choose a platform for creating multi, uh, or a framework, should we say, for creating multi-platform applications, there's a number of different things that really we have to take into consideration. And not only do we need to take in consideration the skill set of the people writing the applications, but also the speed and to develop the applications on those frameworks. Also, the speed of the applications once they're delivered, because as we know, we want to make sure that our customers have fast, responsive applications. So the best way you can get a fast, responsive application is by using a native framework and using something that actually talks right down to the metal. Other than that, we're really starting to look at applications that are using scripting languages, so hybrid applications, or websites that are running specifically out to the mobile. And they're really the three options we have when it comes to mobile is about having either kind of fast native code or having code that's going through an interpreter before it runs um, but still is part of a, a native shell or something that is kind of um, a website that runs. Now. The different approaches obviously bring different abilities in terms of the look and feel for the platform and also different, um, the different approaches bring different um, response times and latency issues um, that need to be looked at and addressed. Now when it comes to actually accessing the device, having full access to the device, you can't get better than native. Um, but there's still quite a lot and a growing capability list for hybrid applications with some of the APIs that they have available. And a really good example of um, uh, how you can tap into the hybrid type of world is using something like HTML5 Builder and PhoneGap and using kind of JavaScript and HTML to produce applications that talk to the um, geolocation APIs and, and so on. And um, you can build those today. And in fact, there's a, a jQuery example that comes with uh, the download you get from the Property Course website, along with uh, a number of native examples for you know, Objective C and uh, Xcode and Java and Android and and so on. So um, they really do give you a good baseline for um, testing your performance and um, your application code against. 
So it really is you know, how to compare different solutions with similar capabilities. Write the same app and get it out there and have a look. So to do that, the Property Cross website has a specification that uh, is on its GitHub project. And um, it basically says the app is a tool for searching UK property listings. It's non-trivial, it's multi-screen, and they give you a, a, a sketch layout of how those screens should look, uh, allowing for the fact that different platforms have different components and visualizations. So you get a very much a, a black and white, this is uh, roughly what you should be producing. But what the application does do is it tests a number of different device capabilities which include page navigation, geolocation, storage, and access to web services. Now the specification talks around using the JSON um, data specification for the feed of data that gets through. The APIs also support uh, XML, so you can work with both. And in fact, I used both within the development cycle for producing this application because initially I used the XML feed because it was quicker to actually get working with and then came back to refactor my code to use the JSON equivalent instead. So still using the same web connectivity, just fetching the data packet in a different format and then added in the code for traversing the JSON uh, rather than the XML. So as you can see here, this is a, a few examples of some of the screens taken from the specification and what's been produced then with FireMonkey for iOS. Now the, um, the components that we have here, we can see here we've got a, a button, we've got another button here, another one here, and another one here. Now these are all um, the same type of buttons. The only difference is that they have a style lookup applied to them. So we'll, we'll look at those in a moment. Um, we've got edit controls and again these are buttons as well. So this is the same component just with a different style lookup to make it look as it should do for where it's being used. Underneath here we've got um, uh, a list box with a group header and then this list box style is set to grouped and um, this is actually taking a feed of data from uh, a persistent set of data and uh, we're using tclient dataset within here rather than um, having to write all the code for doing insert and delete statements and so on from the data storage. And then we have our scrollable list, which is our T-list view uh, with our images and our main text with some detailed text as well. Before we have kind of labels and images and so on um, showing on the final screen here when you click onto the property and the chance to favorite it. So we've used a number of components within the development of this application. Now, one of the first things that the specification talks about was the navigation and using the uh, T tab control. Uh, there's only a handful of screens here, so um, I've actually done them all on the, the same form. Um, we could add multiple forms and then just kind of load those in at the point we need to with a little extra code. Um, but um, I've just used the one tab control with multiple tabs in it and then use the inbuilt T change tab action where we're able to set up some custom text, for example, back uh, or favorites or so on and then having a short uh, then setting our tab to be the tab that we navigate to and then our transition which uh, defaults to transition type none um, but I typically use the transition transition type of slide so we can actually navigate through different um, tab pages and you can see here I've just named them CTA change tab action and then the tab that it moves to so it's easy to locate those in our code. But also we have the, um, the buttons and the button styles um, and that's part of the, the navigation is that you put down your button, you set your style so here is a back button and then link the action property of the button up to the change tab action and that then brings that um, that functionality from the actions through to the buttons, uh, persists the enabled state and so on through as well. 
Okay, so we're just in the IDE here, just to show you, here's the button, um, the action property, literally just drop it down and you can link up to any of the actions that you predefined, and um, my action lists are just here, um, with the, this one that's actually uh, hooked up to search results, which um, has the slide transition and moves, has results as the, the custom text, we could just kind of do something else here and just see as move it around, it will just uh, set that back. Um, and then it's got the, the tab here, which is tab search results, which is the tab that it's going to transition to. So once I've got my basic um, navigation of a few of the views up onto the screen, then very much the next part for me was to actually start being able to see some data on the screen to help me lay out the controls. And to do this, I used a prototype bind source and some of the generators that come within XE4. So using the prototype bind source I added that to a, a data module and you can just see that here in the middle. And then double clicking and adding fields a bit like you would any other data set within Delphi or uh, using C++ Builder. Um, I then went and clicked add new fields definition in essence and uh, added in the generators for contact bitmaps, contact titles, and all this is doing is literally just giving me some run, uh, some design time information that I could work with to help view the layout. Now for each of these generators I added, I've then named them appropriately according to the property data. So the property data is going to have a thumb image, it's going to have a price, it's going to have a detail view, it's going to have um, uh, a main image, it's going to have some rooms text, and uh, it's going to have its own GUID, and also a title. Now this gave me the basis um, of the properties that I was going to be using on my objects that are going to know about the search data when they came back. And that's one of the nice things about the prototype bind source is that having these names here that correspond to the properties of an object, we're actually able to, at runtime, link. A, uh, here I've got a, a property result list, which is a list of type Tina Story of Property. And then using the prototype bind source and using the bind source adapter, we're able to actually bind that list at runtime. So we're able to link the, the model here straight to the view using the one event of this component. So this very much allows us to have a list bind source adapter that links through and then brings all the navigation events um, and actions available through the, uh, through the um, live bindings engine. So we can directly link the, the model straight through to the view very quickly. And um, here we have literally done that. So let's um, we'll, we'll have a look at the, the code as we go through um, a little bit later. But this is very, very powerful because straight away here at design time, we can see prototype information um, giving us a, a view of how it's going to look. And then at runtime here, we can actually see how that view is exactly the same apart from the text and the detail that's been provided in as we've got to the point that we're fetching that data in. Okay, so let's just quickly jump into the IDE here, IDE here and um, we're going to have a look at that object we've just been talking about, the Tina Story of Property. So here we're using Documentation Insight just to give us some information and this is used to manage and filter the returned nodes from the call to the Story of Property API and so it gives us nice documentation insight using well, code insight using the documentation insight tools. So a number of private prop, um, values here, uh, along with some getter and setter um, methods that are being used. And um, here we can see we've got a title, price, an image URL, a detail title, uh, bedrooms, bathrooms, some uh, a thumb image, and so on. And we can see here that this um, is being selected from the cache if it exists and it's returned into the object. So this is quite useful. We can see there's a getter here that is obviously doing some logic underneath. So let's just go and have a look at that. Um, here we can see that it's checking the image state 
and then it's trying to use the image services that we've created in here to go and get the cache image uh, and return it back. Now, this here is um, one of the steps that we'll talk about a little bit later on, but it's just good to see it here from moving beyond the, the basic um, prototype to the live situation where we're able to do some stuff quickly and then refine the speed uh, and the processing afterwards. Um, but here, this is just originally was used to be just getting the image um, directly from the URL and then subsequently we then uh, added in uh, some caching model to enable the speed uh, of that um, loading to be better and a threading model. So using these um, properties we can see here obviously this is what corresponds to what we've got within here you know room text responds to the the method um, so if we actually have a look here at the on create adapter we can see there's our code underneath and if we switch to our main form and if we go and bind visually and let's just expand this up for a moment uh, I should really go and hide all the bits that I'm not using in here. Uh, let's go and have a look here. We can see here's our prototype bind source and we can see it's linked across to all the different controls um, including our list view and then all the, the details. Uh, I probably really should lay this out a little bit nicer. Let's maybe pop this over here and pop this over here somewhere. Um, but we can see that the same prototype bind source is being used for the list of all the details, the image and the text and also um, then when you select it it's then being used to show the detail with the other properties then being assigned to that same object at runtime. Now talking of fetching data, um, we're using components that have been around for a while so a number of you will be used to these and it just goes to show if you have been using Delphi for a number of years now you may well have code that you can move directly onto the mobile platforms today already. So we're using a TID HTTP component to be able to go and collect our data from a website. And that's all done via a specification um, that builds up a URL that we passed out. And that defines if it's going to be XML or JSON. Now initially I was using a TXML document to load in the string that was returned. But subsequently, I've actually um, uh, switched that over to JSON, and um, I used a, a couple of components that um, Pavel had written for the VCL. Uh, Pavel's one of my colleagues here at Embarcadero, um, that he'd written originally for the VCL. And um, taking them and updating them uh, a little bit further, and um, we've published those back up to the uh, Code Central website, I was able to then very much work with the XML document, uh, sorry, then with a JSON document very much in the same way that I did with the XML document, having converted the data into nodes that were hierarchical that we could then traverse through um, to pick up the response node and the property listings within um, the objects that were returned back. Now those objects were converted, uh, all those, that data was then converted into Tina Storia property which is a uh, an object that we created and um, which we've mentioned already a little bit about here actually we see some of the uh, the properties that it will have um, and then the property list which um, we've also mentioned previously so by literally going from our prototype here and being able to run this and see this actually at, um, at runtime as well with data this one line of code then we're able to once we're feeding through and fetching the data we're able to then see the results uh, this, uh, of these objects then showing directly onto the screen. Now there's also some need for persisting data for the search results, um, sorry for the searches not the search results. So the searches should be saved away and brought back next time we open up the application. Now this is a very simple one table um, requirement so rather than having to link in database components for um, storage and access to SQL Lite or indeed to IB Lite. Um, I took the design decision just to use a T-Client dataset because 
it wasn't big amount of data, it was kind of maximum four records that were being persisted. I used a T-Client data set, added some fields that had, here we can see we've got location, an idea, latitude, longitude, and a search date and time, so we can order them. And the nice thing about T-Client data set is it has the ability to save to file and load back from file as well. So that provided a very nice simple solution for um, quickly prototyping this as well um, because I didn't have to set up all the insert statements, the delete statements and so on. I literally could just set up a, uh, a data set, append a record, set the fields, post and the job's done. So very quick and easy to do. And in fact just one line of code as you can see here at the bottom just to set the file names up. So getting the home path, getting the path delimiter because um, that will define which platform we're on, the documents folder, and then naming it with the name for the data set. Because we're talking about the data set, here is our client data set, and we can see we've got the different string fields, we've got float fields, we've got date time fields, um, and to add new fields, again, just like the prototype bind source, just right click, and um, we can do the fields editor here, and add new fields and define it up on the different types that we want it to be, um, name it and so on. We can also do calculated fields in there, but here we just need to then go create our field index and um, this one's um, descending, otherwise I could just put the field name into the field index property um, and that will then help us order the search results with the most recent one at the top. Now having the search results here to show that data on the form um, I've just taken the iPhone edging off here. If we right click and bind visually, here we can see the list box. And if we select the list box here, we can see him. Uh, we've got binding here. We're keeping this in sync. So when we select an item here, it will then go and select that item within the data set. And we're using the location to fill the item text properties here. So that's literally just dragged and dropped across. It's going to fill the list up with the location properties, uh, with the location names and it's going to keep it in sync so when we select there it's going to then move through to the the current data set item as well. Okay so just to, um, to finish off, um, really beyond prototyping the application um, obviously we then kind of go through just cleaning the code up a little bit before we put it out to production but um, the main thing that I had to, to do, um, because we're calling web APIs and um, that was returning back data and um, the, the biggest part really was just making sure that the um, there wasn't anything blocking the UI from displaying up the data at the point that we asked for it to load back and um, you know the, the best way for us to do that was to use the ability of being able to have multiple threads because we are native to load those images back through um, once the user had actually selected um, to load more items now, um, the final thing, obviously, um, after the, the image cache and um, the background threads were added was just to change it from uh, build configuration to, um, to be release. And this then kind of reduces down quite substantially the size of the application um, because uh, we haven't got all the debugging hooks and, uh, and uh, elements within the, ac the application executable. And um, just doing that, we then have our, our application then ready to, to go. So that was, um, that was kind of a, a quick tour around what um, we've done with that. Okay, so before we finish off, let's just run this over to the emulator. And we see here our PA servers um, launched this out for us. Um, I can click on uh, some recent searches here and you can see the um, images loading up. Oh, that's quite nice. One of the images loading up in the background there for us. And um, if we go ahead and maybe let's just add this to our favourites. Uh, let's try and search somewhere else. If I search for um, Banga, I can see that's bringing up the multiple locations of Banga. Um, so let's uh, choose one here. We can see the images loading up. So it's not blocking. Um, we can click to load more and so on. So quite a nice uh, nice example of an application, some nice coding techniques and bits in there and we can see our recent search list with our most recent one at the top 
Um, I could choose my location, but because it's running on the emulator, it's only going to give me somewhere in uh, America and tell me that uh, it can't find. Uh, yeah, I can't find any properties for the given location. So, all the permission and everything running straight through. So just to finish off, um, a quick thank you to Jim Tierney for his um, support with the threading, um, Serena for her UI pointers, and um, Pavel for originally doing the JSON um, components, which I've uh, hacked around with him uh, a little bit recently to update uh, as well. And finally, to, to Colin for his support around the Property Cross project and um, for helping me get to know GitHub a little bit and being able to submit the things through. Um, so thank you very much to all of you. So really, now it's um, time for some Q&A. One from Stephen, how do you load a form with a transition? Uh, I know how to do the tab slide. There's a tab slide code snippet. You've done all mm -hmm. sorts of animations. Uh, you had your, yeah. biz, your biz flow where you were creating forms and then animating them in, in 3D space. Yeah, I've not tried um, creating a, a separate form and animating it in because this um, had you know, just a handful of stuff, so those tab sheets seem to be uh, easy to use. Um, one trick you could do um, is just to have a, a T layout on your form and then uh, create the form and assign the parent of the T layout on that form to be within a tab sheet on your main form and then just run your tab animation and then that would slide it all in because yeah. it would take everything with it. Um, I guess I'd, I'd, I've not tried it, but you could probably try having some startup code in the T form to actually position it out of the way and then run a T animation um, to, to bring it in. But I've um, I've not tried doing that, so I couldn't yeah, say that. On that you create the form off screen and then run an animation to to change its position, you know, it's put the position uh, properties so that it yeah. would slowly move in from the top, bottom, left, right. I, I'm not sure Serena's in here. And is there a yeah. Apple UI uh, issue about having forms versus using tab sheets? Having forms just appear and slide in from some direction? I think at the end, it doesn't really matter as long as it doesn't appear like it's a separate form. And what I mean by that is today, when you're using the tab control, you're sliding and going between the tabs. It's a really a seamless transition for the user so you would just want to make sure that you're mimicking that same um, that same experience and you can try that out with any of the mobile templates actually the tab uh, mobile template in the file new mobile application wizard is a good one to look at just an, as an example of how to implement something like that okay so i see um keith's made a, a request um in here uh, around some threading stuff um, well, the actual the source code for this whole project is going to be made publicly available, so um, you'll be able to download it and play with it. And the whole point of the Property Cross project is that um, it is there and available for for anybody to be able to to take the uh, implementation of the specification that's been done in any of the languages and to have a look at it uh, and see how it works. So um, everything that we've done here. Um, you're going to be able to download and uh, and take through from the property cost website as soon as that goes live, uh, and I'll probably try and get that up in my um, my blog um, later this week as well. Um, so there's a copy of it there that you can you can fetch, but ideally, you really want to just have it in the one place uh, so you can kind of pick it up from there. Uh, a question from Thomas about uh, the the click to fetch more. How do we do that? Um, so. Quite simply, we had an object in the list, which is the, the click to click more object. And um, uh, when you, you click down, it's it's just going to fire through to go fetch some more stuff. But again, yeah, you'll be able to analyze um, how that works within uh, within the code. You know, that's all going to be there and available for you to download. And we had a little bit of fun with that because um, one of the things that uh, the spec asked for was a, a little animation um, thing. And when you kind of got to when we were running off to go and fetch the, the data and then bring it back and then loading the pictures up afterwards, um, we ended up making an asynchronous call um, that kind of ran. So we actually started it off and ran it out to a thread um, to allow the UI to come back and to do the, the drawing rendering. Um, and then it would load up as soon as it kind of came back. So it was kind of it was kind of cool having this kind of asynchronous stuff running through, which was fun. Okay, and um, question from Patrick about the uh, the sessions. Um, 
uh, the uh, all the sessions are going to be made available for replay um, after Code Rage is finished. So um, please do. Um, you know, you're registered, so you'll get the emails sent out. Um, just keep an eye on the Code Rage website and also on the Embarcadero TechNet. Um, so I'll just put, uh, put the link for that into the YouTube thing here. So um, yeah, have a have a look at the Embarcadero TechNet, and there's uh, things come available, and they'll be uh, be showing up on there. So that's cool. Thanks, Stephen. It's great. I think for people to be able then compare ultimately with the property cross system, um, compare what we can do in in native, you know, optimized native code applications uh, versus what people are doing cross platform with things like JavaScript, HTML, and so on. To look at the performance and everything else is just going to be really good. Give people a good comparison of what optimized native code does for you uh, versus other solutions with with you know VMs and runtimes and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait to see Delphi uh, native showing up on this list on PropertyCross.com. Yeah, and I'm I'm kind of looking forward to them showing up in um, some of the uh, the code reusability as well, when you can just add a target platform and uh, and yep. compile. <laughs> and they all the little icons start popping up for the different platforms. I think the other thing is it's another good example of of calling into a remote interface, getting JSON packets and and or XML and working with it because we do live in that connected world. 